37th annual winter lecture series that started that many years ago at the uh, Vine Congregational Church and switched over to uh, our leadership about 17 years ago or 18, I'm not sure exactly. We welcome you. Uh, and there's one more session, we'll mention that and uh, notice, uh, note the name of the speaker at the end of the session. So welcome, uh, we ask you to uh, put your questions in the chat box if you would, and then our uh, moderator and actually our tech specialist will read those chat questions out and summarize them if they're long so we can give maximum time to our speaker to, uh, to answer those. Uh, the other thing we need to say is that uh, we're very happy to have the support of Humanities Nebraska, partial support for our speakers, and also support from the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church, who has been a sponsor since the start. And Ollie, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which is part of the University of Nebraska. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Angeletti. He's an associate professor in the Nebraska Center for Virology and also in the department or the School of Biological Sciences at UNL. He, uh, a little bit about his background, he's a native of Southern California. I think I've got that right. He uh, went to UCLA for his bachelor's degree in biology. From there, he came to the Midwest and uh, obtained his uh, master's degree at Normal University in uh, Normal, Illinois. And then uh, from there, he moved to the University of Alabama at Birmingham, where he obtained his PhD in 1997. Uh, he, this was followed then by a four-year postdoc fellowship at the University of Wisconsin, where he first started working on viral oncology, that is viruses that uh, are associated with cancers and tumors and so forth. And he joined the University of Nebraska and the Center for Virology in uh, 2003. So he's been here uh, about 18, 19 years. And during that time, he's worked primarily on the DNA tumor viruses, on DNA tumor viruses, and primarily on human papilloma virus, which uh, causes a, a cervical cancer. And some of you may know that there was actually a vaccine developed to this particular virus a few years ago. Uh, and, 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 and it's widely available now, but there's still a lot of biology to learn about the virus. And Peter's continued to uh, work with the virus. In recent years, he's actually been doing work in Zambia in Africa, uh, along with Charles Wood, who was a former head of the Nebraska Center for Virology. And specifically, he was looking at the question of what effect did HIV or the AIDS virus have on uh, uh, the human papilloma virus. And, and, and uh, so that's been a, a big uh, uh, background for him. He's uh, published over 30 research papers on viruses and uh, He's won a number of teaching awards, so you get a very fantastic lecture from him tonight. And I'll turn it over to him to talk about zoonosis of SARS-CoV-19. Peter. Wow, thank you, Jim. That was uh, really a great introduction. I really appreciate that. And also I, I wanna thank the, uh, the organizers for the invitation. Uh, let me go ahead and share screen here. Okay. All right. So yes, uh, this is great, and and uh, it's you know uh, this is I I understood that we have a, a group of people that really are interested in all kinds of of uh, uh, biology and things uh, in this audience. So um, I think this will be an interesting topic to discuss. And so what I'm going to look at today is you know the process of zoonosis of SARS coronavirus 2. SARS corona 2 is the, the virus that causes COVID, right? And so in this talk in this talk, I will cover like three concepts that are interrelated, and that is the viral pathogenesis, 
the animal reservoirs and also the variants that we're seeing. Okay, so those will be things that, that I'll, I'll hit on. And just to give you the background on the virus a little bit and you know, cover some of the things that I will be talking about in more detail, uh, I just want to um, you know, familiarize you with the viral particle. So this is SARS-CoV-2, the COVID virus. Um, and as you can see, uh, it has these spiky uh, projections on it. And these are the uh, glycoproteins that are um, actually act as the binding proteins for the cells that, uh, that it infects. And the main protein of interest here is the S protein, the red one, these red triangles. That is the major protein that is required for entry into human cells and other cells, you know, animal cells. So um, if, we're, if we go ahead and slice this virion in half and look on the inside, we see, uh, we can see a little bit more detail. We can see uh, the, the genomic uh, RNA here. So this RNA is basically all the program for the whole virus. Uh, and this virus is a little interesting, I think, because it's not just a small piece of RNA, it's, it's rather large. It's th uh, three, uh, 30,000 nucleotides long, which is pretty big for an RNA virus, right? That has some implications in terms of how the virus uh, evolves, okay? So that means it probably moves a little bit slower than let's say like HIV in terms of evolution. Uh, you can also see in this structure, you can see the S protein spike, okay? That's the one I want you to remember because we're gonna come back to that one uh, throughout the talk. So this virus is what we call an enveloped virus, it has a lipid membrane around it, okay? Um, so again, it, it carries all the, um, you know, the, the RNA and it uh, has these, you know, glycoprotein projections on it that it uses to interact with the cells that it uh, infects. And so just not to go into too much detail about, you know, the whole process, but just to give you, you know, an idea of what's happening here is that basically uh, SARS-CoV-2 knocks on the door of the cell by interacting with a receptor called ACE2, which is actually angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. So it binds to that uh, receptor via this S protein. And that starts this process of fusion where the virion actually fuses with, this, with the cell membrane and the virus actually enters into the cytoplasm of the cell. And this, this virus is an, you know, what we call plus-stranded RNA virus, okay? And what that means is that that virus is ready to translate into protein as soon as it gets into the cell, okay? So as soon as that, you know, virus uncoats the RNA, it will start to translate and make proteins and then, you know, uh, start to replicate the uh, genome and assemble the virions, okay? So that's the basic outline of how uh, the viral life cycle works. Pretty, uh, you know, relatively typical for viruses. And we've all heard in a lot of detail about, you know, the pathogenesis and the, the viral life cycle in terms of, you know, the infection and the, um, you know, the pathology. So we know now that this virus is primarily a respiratory virus, right? Gets in through the airway and infects uh, and starts, you know, a process which involves a very strong inflammatory response, okay? So we're talking about like an innate immune response um, and, and also like beginning the process of generating an adaptive immune response, which involves antibodies. The thing about that is that takes about two weeks to develop antibodies, right? So as, you know, as is you know, often the case with typical RNA viruses is they're gonna do most of their replication long before the immune system can catch up and develop antibodies, okay? Um, and so the virus does most of its replication and it's starting to leave by the time, uh, by the, time uh, the antibodies are being produced. But what we found out with COVID uh, and with the SARS-CoV-2 is that 
it can also have some, you know, rather nasty uh, long-term effects. We, you know, we learned that there's things like, uh, you know, neurological effects, uh, brain fog, and then also even like, um, you know, peripheral neuropathy and organ, uh, you know, damage. And, and also one of the things about it is that there are people that are not able to get rid of the virus completely. And so those people are called long haulers and they tend to have, they tend to have persistent virus. Okay, we know that. And there are also some people that are asymptomatic. And so all of those different features of the, the fact that you can have people that have strong, either strong pathology, weak pathology, or, or no symptoms at all, that has significance in the fact that, you know, these viruses can hang around in the population for a long time. That's where part of the problem with uh, SARS-CoV-2 is. And so, um, you know, I, I re you may recall that early on when this, uh, when this pandemic started, uh, people, you know, we heard a lot of, you know, people saying things like, oh, well, it's just a flu. And so, you know, uh, it's not a flu and let's talk about why. Um, it's not just a flu. Well, for one thing, you know, what we found out about SARS-CoV-2 is that it has a high person-to-person -person transmission rate, okay? It's a highly infectious uh, virus, okay? It can have high pathogenicity, which we just kind of discussed, right? It's variable in that department, we, we already know, okay? It's, uh, its mode of transmission is aerosolized virus in droplets. Uh, and so this is the big problem that we're facing, of course, is that's why everybody's wearing masks, right? That, so the aerosolized virus, uh, you know, distrib or like, you know, transmission efficiency is very high. And that's uh, one of the major problems with it. But by far, the most important aspect of this is the fact that the human population has no immunologic memory for this virus. Okay, that's you, you know, it's tabla rasa, it's like blank slate. You know, we, you know, your immune system has never seen it before. So that's a big part of this problem. Okay, so, and uh, this also brings back, and if you're a virologist, uh, you, you, when this whole thing started with, uh, with uh, COVID, uh, we, we, we were familiar with some of the aspects of these pandemics and we had seen these things before okay and some of you may remember this that we actually had SARS-CoV-1 you know uh, the SARS virus and that was in uh, 2002 th 2003 and then there was another virus called MERS and then of course everybody remembers Ebola although completely different virus some of the aspects of the you know these outbreaks have some you know, um, have some similarities, right? So um, just to, you know, talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-1. So this was an outbreak that happened in Guangdong province in China, right? Uh, and again, it was 2002, 2003. And uh, the Chinese CDC found evidence that this virus uh, was, was in these palm civet animals. And these are like, uh, sort of like a cat, a combination of sort of a weasel and a cat kind of animal. And then also these, um, the badger, their uh, Chinese version of a badger uh, also had this virus in it. And uh, they also found that the same virus that was in those civet animals was found in people who had handled those animals. So about 50% of, of handlers, animal handlers, uh, had antibodies to this SARS-CoV-1, okay? And then, you know, people that worked with any life, uh, life uh, wildlife, uh, they were also at high risk for infection with this SARS-CoV-1. So again, this virus was a respiratory virus causing a very, you know, a dry cough and, you know, all of the really the typical symptoms that we already now know very well. Uh, for SARS-CoV-2. So again, it was like, we, oh, we know this story. We've already heard this. And the last time we encountered this, we said, oh, it's not that bad. You know, we thought, 
because really, you know, you know, it, uh, you know, it never really took up, never really took over. Okay. So, but I remember, uh, you know, that, you know, back in 2003, uh, I was heading to Thailand. I was on the flight, uh, you know, going through Japan. And at that time, you know, people were all wearing masks because of the, uh, the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak. So, you know, uh, it's all very reminiscent now, uh, you know, looking back on that. But uh, just wanted to point out some of the um, aspects of this that there's some overlap in these different viral outbreaks. And that is the fact that the uh, center for like the, the infections came from the markets where uh, live animals were sold or uh, being butchered for, uh, for meat. And so this uh, is just a slide showing the uh, Quinn Ping uh, market in Guangzhou. Uh, where they were trading in live animals. And so this palm civet that's shown here is the animal which was thought to be the, uh, the reservoir for uh, SARS-CoV-1. Uh, now that's not to say that there aren't other animals in these kinds of markets that could also um, carry the virus, right? But, but that was the major one in this, um, in this case. And so, um, so they had done some nice uh, sequencing work and found that the virus in uh, these uh, civet animals was 99% identical uh, to you know, the sequences in, um, in, the, in the people who were infected. And so this you know, is an animal that's commonly, you know, uh, sold for, for meat. And so that's really part of the problem here is, you know, the, the processing of wild animal meats for consumption. That's part of the huge problem, right? And so um, the other part of the story relates to yet another incident of where uh, we had spillover of a SARS coronavirus into the human population. And that was this Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS, okay? And so once again, it was a case of a very highly pathogenic virus that spilled over into the human population. Um, and when I say um, uh, highly pathogenic, it relates to the fact that it causes what we call cytokine storm. And that is like uh, too much inflammation. And this is what actually is, is the problem with regard to the uh, respiratory uh, you know, distress that people get into. And it's the same thing with 1918 flu. So this is the common theme here, SARS-CoV-1, uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, uh, MERS, they, and 1918 flu for that matter, they all cause this respiratory distress caused by a uh, cytokine storm. And so just this is kind of our, our overview of what really happened here for SARS-CoV-1 and, and MERS. So the original source of uh, these, these viruses comes from, they come from bats, okay? And um, in the case of SARS-CoV-1, they were transmitted to people through these civet animals, okay? Um, and of course, people came in contact with them, with them at those marketplaces where they purchased uh, the meat. And uh, in the case of MERS, the intermediary animal was camels. So it turned out that, you know, camels probably came in contact with, you know, feces or excre excrement from uh, the bats and got infected and then, you know, people came in contact with camels and became infected that way. In both cases, these infections, both for SARS-CoV-1 and for MERS, they were uh, fairly limited in their spread. And that's what really saved all of us from uh, the kind of pandemic that we now have experienced with SARS-CoV-2. So let's talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2 and, and we'll come back to some other details about um, other outbreaks. Uh, where, where, where there is some parallel. 
So um, we just we just talked about the SARS-CoV-1 and the intermediary host was the civet animal. Uh, and for MERS, the intermediary host was camel. And then for SARS-CoV-2, in fact, we don't know for sure what the intermediary host is, but there was some suggestion that this uh, pangolin animal might be the intermediary host. Now, the, the intermediary host is an important step because, you know, that these viruses evolve as they move through these animals. And that's important because uh, it's thought that they need to evolve in order to become more infectious in humans. Okay. And so that intermediary host is probably the way in which they become more infectious in human beings. Okay. And so for, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, we, I think we're pretty clear that bats are involved and, you know, there's some pretty good work that's been done already that showed that uh, bats that were re recovered from uh, caves in southern China in the area of Wuhan have highly similar, uh, you know, SARS coronaviruses. So they could do alignments and they know that these viruses are very close to SARS-CoV-2. And then this brings up the question about what was the role, if there was a role um, of this uh, wildlife market in Wuhan. And I'm sure everybody's heard about this. The bottom line here is the kinds of, uh, you know, wild animal processing that takes place at the, this market is this very similar to what we saw with the Guangzhou market. Um, you know, it's all kinds of different wild animals. Um, uh, that are being processed, and uh, you know this is this is the major issue. Uh, is it possible that this is the the source? Yes, it's possible, but there was no clear evidence in this case. And in, in the first case for SARS-CoV-1, there was clear evidence that the civet was the intermediary host, right? And in this case, we don't have any clear evidence of the the chain of movement. Okay. And I don't know what, whether we were, will actually be able to uh, clarify that relationship or not. But um, it seems plausible at this point. Now, um, this also brings back the fact that we have other um, outbreaks in which, uh, you know, transmission to the human population was. Uh, maybe through, um, you know, bushmeat, and that was Ebola in Africa, okay? And so we all remember those Ebola outbreaks. And in fact, when I look back in, at that, there have been many outbreaks, you know, it's maybe 10 or 20 outbreaks over since the 1970s, okay? Multiple outbreaks. And so what we have in Africa is, you know, a lot of the, the you know, kind of bushmeat trade where they you know, collect all kinds of different animals from the forest, from the jungles, monkeys, you know, kind of like um, even that the pangolin type animal. Um, and even in this case, you can see the bats that have been recovered from, uh, you know, from the forest. And uh, so, you know, this is a common thing. The issue here with Ebola is that no intermediary species had actually been identified for Ebola either. Okay, so this has been the problem about understanding, you know, um, you know, what is the inter intermediary host? We know that some bats have been found to have Ebola. Yes, that has been shown, but we haven't seen any intermediary host. But it's clear enough to say that in all of these cases, people are coming in contact with virus by interacting with the environment, by, you know, maybe harvesting uh, you know, animal uh, materials, or animal uh, products. And just to give you a little bit of a, you know, some thoughts on this is that, you know, there's more than one different mode in which um, a virus can come in contact with a human being, right? And so we can think about it like this, that it could be that people are coming in contact with excretions from the animal, um, 
And in all these cases, though, we have to think about like all the all the things that need to happen for uh, you know for this transmission event to take place. If we're talking about excretions from an animal, the pathogen needs to be stable, like it needs to be stably maintained. And we we understand that these RNA viruses are not you know they're not very stable, um, but the pathogen needs to be stable. Uh, in some form as it's transported. Maybe, you know, um, it's, maybe it's on a piece of fruit or something like that, that's possible. Um, so, but in all these cases, when we talk about the mode of, of transmission from, you know, let's say bat excretion, it, it, uh, it always relates to human behavior. And it, it really talks about the fact that human beings are the ones who are disturbing the natural environment. They are the ones that, that are deforesting the areas. They are the ones that are moving their farms deeper in the jungle. Okay, so there's an ecological message here with regard to that. So when we think about that mode of uh, transmission through excretions, but probably more abundant is the mode of like that harvesting meat from the jungle. And that is like slaughtering animals of all different kinds, right? And so that's probably the most common method of coming in contact. And once again, though, um, the transport of the meat uh, needs to maintain the infectivity of the virus before it comes in contact with humans, right? And then the third possible mode of zoonosis is through vectors, right? And so by vectors, we mean mosquitoes, ticks, you know, larvae, any kind of like you know, insect vector that breaks the skin. Uh, these are uh, another mode in which viruses can be uh, transmitted and um, biting insects, right? So that's the other way. But again, um, you know, different viruses are likely to be present there. And I mean, you could point to things like West Nile, dengue and those kind of things, but uh, not, not likely to be the case for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so in all these cases, whether depending, you know, which mode it, um, of, you know, uh, the, the zoonosis takes place, it still requires a certain amount of dose of virus and a um, availability of, of quantity of virus in order for the infection to take place. Okay. And then there's always the question about whether a virus, when it is like moved from animal to human, is to whether it can actually replicate, okay? You know, uh, a lot of viruses we come in contact every day, we come in contact with every day and they don't infect humans. I'll give you an example, Tabasco sauce. A Tabasco sauce is full of plant viruses, right? Uh, but it doesn't infect humans, right? <laughs> you come in contact with that all the time. Um, not a problem. So this, this, uh, uh, slide is just to kind of give you an idea of all the things that need to just perfectly line up for transmission or spillover to human beings for that to happen. So first of all, you have to have a reservoir, uh, you know, species in the pot, you know, in the uh, forest or whatever. You have to have this reservoir species, and it has to have you know relatively high density. It also has to have the the pathogen that you're, you know, that you're concerned about in, in high levels. Uh, you know, it has to have a high level of infectivity, that pathogen, right? Um, it has to, that pathogen then needs to be released from the animal in some way, whether it's uh, from direct contact or from butchery of the animal, right? Um, uh, the pathogen itself needs to survive the process of moving it from the jungle or from wherever it came from. Uh, the other thing is you need to have the opportunity for human exposure, right? It may, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. It's all about human behavior. Um, there are also structural barriers that can take place like, you know, that the uh, animals are, you know, kept in a location or a freezer or whatever in a way that keeps them separate from human beings, right? The other thing is, like I said, is this concept of whether uh, there is actually some compatibility between this pathogen and the host, right? The, the new host, the human being. 
And so just to, to, you know, the final summary on it is to look at this graph on the right here, which shows the dose level and the changes in dose level over time, right? That, so in other words, that you, these opportunities for exposure only happen when the conditions are just right. And there's a significant amount of virus. Not every animal carries the virus, right? So this is what happens. And so it's by uh, bad luck that this happens. But what you know, what we all know about human you know, nature is that we will find a way to get infected, right? I mean, this is what we've proven this over and over with the way we behave with regard to, you know, environmental destruction, deforestation, you know, and all of those uh, kinds of things, right? And so uh, it's an ongoing similar theme. We look at these different viral outbreaks and we see a lot of similarities. You know, we see the fact that bats are one of the major reservoirs for viruses, which are just terrible for human beings. We, we've seen that. The second thing that we, we found is that in most cases, we can identify an intermediary species in which you would say that the viruses are fine tuning. They're fine tuning in a way that makes them more uh, able to infect human beings. Okay. And I just want to point out, so here we've talked already about SARS-CoV-1. We mentioned MERS, you know, briefly, and these viruses are related. They're both coronaviruses. I mentioned Ebola, okay. Uh, and there's two other viruses over here on, on the left here, Hendra and Nipah. And so these are really just uh, very nasty viruses in the Morbilli virus family. And these, again, are you know, uh, uh, bat-borne viruses that get transmitted through domestic, uh, you know, farm animals to people. And the pathogenicity in people for this virus is between 45 and 95 percent, right? So these are just terrible viruses. And we've only ever seen outbreaks of those in, uh, you know, small circumstances. There are just a few circumstances. Um, okay, so COVID-2 um, also, like we said, it has uh, an intermediary species, probably uh, pangolin, but we're not entirely sure. But I wanted also to talk about the, the other features of these, uh, you know, the viruses as they move into the human population. Um, that, and that is that um, they, uh, they have a certain innate infectivity or the ability to transmit it to multiple hosts at a, at a given time, okay? And so that is a property that we call the r naught value. And so let me give you the definition of that. Uh, and that is the average number of people or, you know, individuals that one person uh, that, that get infected by, you know, from one person uh, with a virus uh, at, at the time of infection. So from a first index patient, how many people get infected? That's the question, right? And so what you see up here in at the top is that uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, uh, the R value or the R naught value is about 2.5, okay? So that's how many people can get infected from a single infected person on average. Could be more, could be less, depends on the circumstances, right? And you see that MERS um, is much better as far as infectivity from a single person. The all-time winner of this r not value uh, calculation is measles, right? And measles is like mm, 14, 15 from a single um, infection, infection event, okay? All right, so there's that, that's r not, And um, this is one of the major like um, sort of calculations for the dynamic of infection to tell us, you know, how much we need to worry about spread of, of the virus, right? And the other thing, of course, is mortality. That's one of the other major things that we care about with these viruses. And so this graph here is basically looking at fatality rate versus the r not value. And so you remember I mentioned measles and I told you measles is one of these viruses that has a high r not value. So you can see that it's about 15 
on the graph here, way on the right side. But as far as fatality, it's relatively low. This is a log scale, but it's relatively low. It's uh, fatality is like about 30%. Um, uh, then um, uh, you, of course, uh, common cold and chicken pox have basically no uh, mortality or fatality level, uh, but they do have different um, levels of, of the R0 value. And then if we look and we see some of the viruses that are just terrible for human beings, uh, they're up here on the left, and we're talking about MERS, bird flu, Ebola, 1918 flu, SARS-CoV-1, uh, and smallpox, right? So these are all very bad viruses for human beings. They happen to have a lower R0 value, but relatively high fatality. And these, all of these things relate to having an overactive immune response, you know, uh, innate immune response. And then here is SARS-CoV-2, uh, and it is indicated by this light pink uh, rectangle. Uh, we don't, you know, have a really precise number exactly on the, um, you know, on this virus yet, uh, be, for obvious reasons, because it's still in motion. But so this is, these are the characteristics of, of these uh, viruses uh, in terms of their fatality rate and their R0 value. So, you know, then we really need to like analyze this and, and there's some very fundamental questions that come up here, you know, uh, like why is it that we see this high level of pathogenicity in, you know, these viruses that happen to be present in, in bats, right? We see this high level of pathogenicity, um, you know, and, you know, why is this, why is this happening and what is the concern here? Well, you know, whether or not the, the virus is transmitted directly from bats to humans or through an inter intermediary species, it's, there's one thing that's absolutely clear, and that is that these viruses are uh, novel to the host. And that is to say that, that human beings have no immunologic memory of these viruses. That's one of the major issues with it. And here I'm talking about SARS-CoV-2, right? I mean, there's no immunologic memory. Uh, so therefore the immune system responds very strongly and we would say too strongly uh, to these, this virus. And yes, yeah, so, okay. And then the other thing here is this, since it is a novel virus, it also has novel, um, levels of, you know, pathogenesis that it's capable of, right? Uh, so, and it, it's all a matter of chance as to whether these viruses that come in contact with humans, do they have the ability, does their machinery have the ability to replicate in humans? And what uh, kind of response do they, they cause as far as the immune system, okay? But what we do know about these really pathogenic viruses, whether we're talking about MERS, SARS-1, or you know, SARS-CoV-2, is that you know, they tend to be highly pathogenic in humans, uh, but they're also under tremendous ecological or evolutionary selection here, okay? So they're under tremendous evolutionary selection, all right? Well, that, what, what that really means is that in order to be successfully transmitted from person to person after they've moved from the animal, they will need to mutate. They'll need to mutate, why? Why? Because they, they need to fine tune their, uh, you know, like uh, uh, genes in order to be efficiently transmitted from host to host, okay? So, and these would be uh, maybe some, in some cases, pre-existing mutations or mutations that occur along the way. Uh, in, in any case, we're talking about accumulation of a population of viral mutations that have, you know, like, you know, some of them are viruses that are good at replicating at humans, and some of them are not so good. The ones that are not so good will not hang around, okay? So that's kind of what happens. 
And so this graph really kind of explains the relationship and there's actually kind of a silver lining in this whole thing, okay? So like I said, I mean, the issue here is that these terrible viruses that we're getting from bats, they do not belong in human beings, right? So they're novel viruses to humans, right? They're highly pathogenic for that reason, partly. Uh, and the immune response is, you know, very strong. We're we talked about the cytokine storm, that happens. But here's the issue with it. A virus that's highly virulent cannot hang around long in a population because it's too lethal to a host. You know, the um, examples like SARS-CoV-1, MERS, you know, high pathogenicity uh, is, it, it uh, has a negative effect on their virus's ability to transmit from host to host. This is the why these viruses are under, under tremendous selection, okay? So they're under a lot of selection to actually attenuate, to become less lethal. To, in other words, to be a good, uh, you know, a, a good uh, uh, guest, you know, a, in the host. And so they will become attenuated over time. And so you could, for example, you can think about chicken pox. You know, most people uh, have chicken pox or had chicken pox up until the vaccine was um, you know, adopted and widely. But the point is that, that virus is very attenuated in human beings, right? Um, most viruses uh, will become attenuated. So what I'm really telling you here is it is the first exposure of virus from the wild that is the most pathogenic, okay? That's the issue. So here we're saying virulence, but virulence and pathogenicity, same thing, right? the good news is that it gets better over time. And so here's the, here's the idea here. Why is, that, why is it better to be less virulent as a strategy if you're a virus? Well, just think about it. If your host is so sick that they're either in bed or they, you know, they die, right? You have less chance of transmission, right? Um, if the virus is less virulent, then it's more likely that the person will be able to move around and spread virus. So that's a better strategy. And actually, well, in, in you know, evolution terms, we would say it was, it's a more fit strategy you know, for that virus. And so that's what takes place often is, is this attenuation or like um, evolution toward, toward less virulence, okay? And that is what's happening as we speak with SARS-CoV-2. It will take a long time, but it's happening, right? Now, then you can ask the other question. We hear this all the time. People ask the question, well, why don't bats die from SARS-CoV-2? And that's a great question, right? I mean, you know, it seems a little unfair, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, everybody, all these uh, everybody is sick and, and the, you know, the virus doesn't seem to do much to bats. And it's, it's exactly right. They, the, the, the bats are unaffected by, by the virus. And that is because they've kind of uh, reached a truce with the virus, right? And so, it, it, you know, the analogy here is we're used to chicken pox virus and it's, uh, you know, um, attenuated in humans for the most part. Uh, so there's disease tolerance. It's the same thing for the bat and SARS-CoV-2, okay? Um, and there are even versions of, you know, immunodeficiency virus in chimpanzees, the SIV, which is a cousin to HIV, and that's also a uh, disease tolerance situation between those um, animals and, and, and the virus. It's just that when the virus moves to um, another species, then uh, it starts over the process of becoming attenuated and it, it often can take some time before it reaches a level of attenuation, okay? And in human beings, of course, you know, high early pathogenicity uh, and some people have better immune uh, protection than others. You know, the people that have a good MHC or a good like, you know, adaptive immune response, uh, they have, you know, a better chance to kind of recover from the virus. And that's kind of what's being shown in these graphs here at the bottom here. All right, so what we know about um, uh, 
SARS-CoV-2, SARS-1, and MERS is that they have, you know, different levels of um, fatality or like mortality level um, uh, versus transmission. And so if you look at MERS here, uh, the case fatality is about 34%. And for SARS-1, it was a, about 9.6%. And the measurement we're getting uh, with COVID-19, the most recent measurement is about 2.2%, okay? So it's got a lower fatality rate than MERS and SARS-1, but um, it's so much more of a problem. And the reason why is that it's getting transmitted more widely. It's in, in a, encountering a lot more people. And you can see from the numbers, this is old, uh, old data, of course, but it, you can see from the numbers here, the number of deaths from SARS-1, approximately 774, number of cases, 8,000. And we all know that the number of cases for COVID is just through the roof, right? So this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a much more successful virus. It's actually less pathogenic and much more successful than these other ones, okay? But uh, it's clear that SARS-CoV-1 was, you would say kind of a precursor to CoV-2 uh, in, in uh, entering the human population. Okay, so I mentioned uh, the S protein. So S protein is an important part of this whole story. Uh, the S protein is a, uh, a glycoprotein spike on the virus, right? And so you can think about that S protein as kind of like that's the key for the lock to get into the cell, okay? And so here's our structure of the S protein here, okay? And it has a domain uh, known as the receptor binding domain shown in pink here. And you could see that it interacts with its receptor on the cell, which is this ACE2 uh, uh, protein. Now, the thing to keep in mind here is this virus is jumping species, jumping from bats to a civet or bat to a, you know, um, you know, cat or uh, or the the pangolin, and maybe then to humans. In each case, this protein is going to be under tremendous evolutionary pressure. Okay, so this is what needs to happen. It needs to change so that it can adapt to the receptor in a new host. That's a lot of what's happening, uh, um, you know, that we're seeing in, in evolution of this virus. And it seems to be that was kind of the key thing in evolution of these SARS-CoV uh, viruses, both CoV-1 and CoV-2, for adapting to infection in, in the humans. And so this diagram kind of helps you to put that in perspective. So here's our bat. And the bat has a certain receptor unknown to us. Uh, and SARS-CoV-2 can bind to that receptor clearly, right? The virus moves to another in intermediary species. Here's our pangolin, because we're going to blame it on the pangolin right now. Uh, and uh, what's happened now is this S protein in that virus has to mutate in order to get better binding to this receptor. And that it, it achieves that goal, infects the animal, and by doing so in that intermediary host, it becomes similar enough to then make the jump to human beings, okay? And then in human beings, there's further modification of the S protein. And you could think about, about it like, oh, it's just fine tuning. You know, we're just fine tuning the S protein to make the virus more efficient in doing its, its job of uh, infecting that host. So that's what's happening. And it happens every single time the virus jumps species. And we've seen already, you know, and it's, it's been in the news a lot, a lot of talk about these variants, right? And it started even early last year um, in 2020, we saw evidence of these SARS-CoV-2 variants in Europe in, in South America, in Africa, and just this is just a quick example of that, you know, um, 
uh, and this is phylogenetic chart just to show the diversity and each one of these spots on the chart represents uh, on the, uh, the map represents a different variant uh, arising uh, in a different location uh, on the map. Okay, so we've seen a lot of this. And, uh, and here's yet another one where we're talking here about the uh, California variants coming up, okay. And then, uh, and then this is a, a, a really great figure for us then to kind of put this all together and try to understand what's going on here, okay. And so this chart is showing our S protein, uh, the spike protein from the virus that's shown here. And you see different colors on this uh, molecule. And as you see, uh, the spots on the molecule that are shown in yellow, those are places where there were mutations that occurred when the virus moved from humans to animals. Okay, so that we have cases in which the uh, SARS-CoV-2 has moved from humans to animals, okay? So there are mutational change changes that are reflected after those movements to animals. And the other things that are on this chart are the places in the molecule where there uh, was the UK variant, and those are shown in red, okay? This is the N-terminal domain, N uh, NTD. And then um, here's another uh, red spot there. That is, these are the UK variants. And then the blue spots are the, <clears throat> uh, the South Africa variants, okay? So here, the blue spots are the South Africa mutations. So these are human mutations that occurred in human beings, okay? And you see that these are in the major domains that are um, areas that are coming in contact with the ACE receptor, okay? And so this part of the molecule, it says RBD, that means receptor binding domain. And that's the part of the molecule that's under the most selective pressure. So you see, we've got a bunch of different colored spots here, yellow, blue, and then there's also purple here. And what purple is, is a combination of variants or mutations between the um, UK, and the South African variant. Okay, so I, I've already told you now there's a bunch of different mutations. And in fact, the mutations occur in different hosts as they get transmitted. And so you can see all the, the animals that are indicated here. So we have, you know, like ferrets and mice and uh, hamsters and uh, even dogs and uh, lion. Uh, human beings um, and, um, and house cat. So these are all animals in which, uh, you know, mutations have taken place. And this is very important because what it really is speaking to is this virus has a tremendously wide host range, okay? That is, it can affect a lot of different animals. And each time it gets into a new animal, it's under further selection to make changes to the S protein. And uh, you can think about it like renovating, you know, it renovates the virus uh, for another round. So this is why this is an issue here. And so now here's just another example of a paper in which uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, D614G uh, S protein mutation, uh, that particular mutation this happens in humans, it actually increases the efficiency with, with which the virus can enter the cells through that ACE2 binding, okay? So this again shows you that these mutations are very important because they increase on some occasion or in some situation, increase the efficiency of the virus with infecting human beings, okay? And then we've seen a lot in the news and, and uh, you know, you have to be really careful about what you look at on the news. And here's a pretty, uh, you know, uh, I guess kind of scary looking uh, post that was up that said cases of super COVID uh, in the US and they showed different variants uh, located throughout the US. But what I'm gonna remind you about here 
is the fact that these viruses encounter the new human host, they're going to become less pathogenic. It's only the first couple rounds that they really are highly pathogenic. They don't, they can't maintain that pathogenicity. It's a matter of time that they just, they weaken. So I think a lot of times what we're reading in the news media is, is just scaring people uh, without really conveying the truth about what's going on here, you know? So I think we need to keep that in mind. But, but it's important to point out that yes, there are a lot of variants out there. Yes, there are. Uh, and the variants are coming from all different you know, species, put it, put it that way. Now, um, and then here's another paper that was recently um, published that, that showed that there was an incident of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 to mink animals, and you know those are mink are related to ferrets, and you know these are um, uh, animals that are very susceptible to those kinds of viruses. So that uh, incident happened, um, and uh, uh, so it tells us that we need to be careful because this is happening in the U.S. Right, and also there were recent examples of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 in zoos to gorilla. Uh, tigers, lions, uh, leopards, different animals. So again, get back to the concept of high, um, you know, like uh, the, the sort of uh, wide host range, right? So this virus has a very wide host range. Uh, it's a big problem. And that is because we have the possibility of generating a reservoir of SARS-CoV-2 in animals in uh, North America, that's a problem, right? So we already know, just uh, going down our list here, we know that this virus can affect bats, civets, maybe pangolins, mink, ferrets, uh, pigs. There's a, a couple of reports not clear exactly. House cats, yes. Leopards, lions, tigers, cougars. Uh, dogs, rarely, we, there was a couple of events where that happened gorilla, mice, hamster. And you know, I think you can easily speculate that there are others. And again, my concern with this is, is the, you know, having a reservoir that is gonna come back and reinfect the human population again. And so just to um, talk about some of the, um, you know, the comparison of the mortality effect that we've seen with uh, SARS-CoV-2 compared to other uh, viral pandemics. So we can compare. And so I drew in this uh, tombstone on this figure here, just because we, you know, this is, we're still, this pandemic still going. We don't have a complete number on what the, the total, you know, uh, fatality is. But right now it looks like it's about 2.5 million. Uh, and so where does that stand with, uh, with regard to these other viruses? Well, um, HIV is 30 million, okay? Um, 1918 flu, 50 million at least, right? So SARS-CoV-2 is still way under those. Uh, are we, should we still be concerned? Absolutely, we, sh we still need to be concerned. It's uh, not as bad as those. Um, other ones like, uh, there's, you know, smallpox, Hong Kong flu, Russian flu. And then uh, you recall that I mentioned Hendra and Nipah, that's 1994. Um, you know, there were really not many cases. But once again, that was a very highly pathogenic virus. Um, it, it was just not really good at transmitting. What we have with SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that is transmitting pretty well. This is an ongoing story, uh, uh, still a lot of concern about where the story ends up. Now, what have we learned and what should we, how should we be changing the way we behave? Well, there are a lot of things that take away from this. And one of them is that the live animal and bushmeat markets uh, either have to be very highly regulated or they need to be ended completely because we've already shown with SARS-CoV-1 that that was absolutely the source of uh, that infection, okay? The crossover from wild 
viruses to humans, that's the problem. And again, behavior-wise, deforestation, habitat destruction, moving farms into the jungle, and this kind of stuff is happening in, you know, in, in South America and, and also in Southeast Asia, we see a lot of that. Um, so this is a concern, right? Um, and of course, like personally, uh, we, we have to, you know, to protect ourselves, continue using PPE as we have been. Uh, we, and, you know, as far as travel, we really have to be careful about uh, contact with these kinds of animals. And this is maybe a general thing, but also a kind of a, a point about, you know, you know, uh, you know, be careful when coming in contact with wild animals, uh, like bats and in places where bats are plentiful, that's the issue. Um, and then also new things to think about here is precautions with regard to interacting with not only wild animals, but contact with farm animals. Uh, because now we know that, you know, people can transmit virus to animals, right? Uh, and also I would say that it's probably fair to, to at least think about or be concerned about, uh, uh, you know, contact of your pet, you know, uh, and, you know, more concerned with cats than dogs, right? But once again, the problem here is in developing a reservoir. So uh, long term, we need to think a little bit more about monitoring wild and domestic animals uh, uh, in North America for the presence of the virus, okay? We, we probably need to think about that. Um, and, and again, because why? Because the virus will mutate in those different species and maybe transmit back to human beings. That's the problem. And so then um, this is kind of the overall picture that it really, you know, we're starting to understand that uh, we're not separate from the natural world. We're just a part of the natural world, right? So uh, there's this concept of like uh, the sort of one biology concept, right? And so we are just a part of this process. And so what we're experiencing is tremendous zoonosis <laughs> in which uh, we're uh, experiencing viruses that came from bats and other animals uh, and in, they've infected us, you know, uh, and um, we, we got smart and we started to develop vaccines and we're using our PPE and we think we're pretty clever. But the part that we haven't thought about is, well, we need to shut down this uh, flow of virus on both sides. We need to shut down movement of virus from humans to animals and from animals back to humans. We need to think about both of those sides of it. And of course, make sure everybody is vaccinated. Okay. And let's see, I think that is all I have. Yeah. And so that uh, I'm, uh, finished, and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, I do have some questions for you. Are you able to stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I got there it for you. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I just want to let everyone know that uh, you should be able to uh, turn on your video if you would like. Uh, and the first question is from Linda. She asks, why can't a single virus particle initiate disease? why can't a single virus particle initiate disease? Well, um, it's a, it's a if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, you know, the disease process is because of millions of SARS-CoV. One virus itself is usually not, it's not enough. It amplifies into millions and maybe billions. And then that's when it causes its disease effect, right? Thank you. And then we have a lot of questions about bats. <laughs> so the first question is from Harry. He asks, why do bats seem to be our nemesis for passing on viruses that can affect humans? Ah, it's, it's such a great question. And you know, 
this is it's something that we really need to start to understand. Uh, what what we can really look at here is is the fact that bats are so different immunologically from human beings. Okay, their immune systems actually are quite different than ours, right? So what happens is the virus is adapting to batness, you know, to the bat world, and by becoming a bat virus, uh, you know, when it comes back to human beings it's terribly pathogenic. It's an accident of nature, right? Okay, but it's important to keep in mind that, you know, these zoonotic events happen all the time. It's just that most of them you never see. Why do you never see them? Because they're not successful, okay? We, we see these because they are successful in the process. But I agree, it's a, you know, this is, we're gonna learn a lot about how to try to stop these viruses from getting into humans. Okay, and then the next question, given that bats are the culprit, are there any strategies to reduce the capacity of bats to reproduce and thus eliminate them as a species? Ah, that's a good, that's a really good question. And so I think that uh, most uh, ecologists and environmentalists uh, would, would uh, argue that bats have an important role in the uh, ecology of the planet. And I mean, you could look at the bats that eat insects, they do an important job, you know. Uh, so I, I think in terms of ecological, you know, you know, picture, I think that that, you know, that's not uh, maybe the right approach. Maybe we should look at some other approaches uh, like, um, you know, attenuating, adding attenuated viruses, that might be a way to look at it. But uh, the other thing is, I think a big part of this is really behavior modification for humans. We are the problem. We are the ones that are getting bushmeat we're the ones that are making the mistake, putting farms in the middle of the jungle, right? So that's kind of my, my uh, view on it. Thank you. Could you more, uh, could you clarify a little bit more explicitly? Priscilla wants to know, how does the virus pass from bat to human? Okay, yeah, so good examples. I mean, uh, again, it's, it's either uh, the feces or X or the uh, uh, urine of the bat and it could be direct contact with that or the intermediate animals. And so when, you know, we're talking about the bush meat and when somebody harvests, harvests the bush meat and it's raw, that's the state in which the virus is infectious in that bush meat. So maybe a person brings that meat home and they're, they're processing it and they, maybe they cut themselves or they touch their face. That's all it takes. You touch your face, when you're, you know, you're preparing the meat, that's what happens. And this is happening, you know, this is quite common in, in a lot of parts of the world. And then another question, is it likely that humans will pass this on to other animals? Yeah, so that's exactly what I was trying to point out is that not only is it likely, it's already happened. And that's why what I, I the bigger picture, looking at the bigger picture is, we need to stop viruses from moving from bats to humans and also stop human, the virus in humans moving to animals. I'm talking about COVID-2 here. All right, we need to block both sides of that because by, you know, like I said, what we're creating in North America is a reservoir of SARS-CoV-2 if we're not careful. You know, that's the problem. We don't want that. There's a question about the bats that are common in the United States and Nebraska. Are they likely to carry this virus or not? That's a great question. As far as we know, um, the, the bats that carry uh, these uh, viruses are tropical bats, the fruit eating type of bats. We don't have the same species in North America at all. You know, and the bats here are much smaller. I think they're entirely different. It's unlikely that they would carry that virus but we don't know for sure, you know. Thank you. Moving on to vaccination. Uh, the tutors wanna know, once we are vaccinated, will we still have a possibly short infectious period when we could expose others? No, um, so as far, from my understanding of, of the quality of the vaccination is, you know, you will be thoroughly protected. You will not get infected for most of what I've seen, I, I don't think that people will get super infected, as we call it, you know. Um, it's not, 
it, the, the immunity is excellent for both of the vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna, they're excellent. And let's see, another question. If you're vaccinated, are you still potentially infectious to others? Like, could you transmit the virus? No, uh, as I said, so the, the vaccines are not actually viruses. So uh, the vaccines themselves are just a part. In fact, they are the S protein. So just the S gene, that's all that's made up of in these vaccines. So uh, you're not infectious at all once you've taken the vaccine. Now, uh, the question about whether it's possible to get infected by, uh, uh, by COVID you know, after you're vaccinated, um, I think it's unlikely. And even if you, you did get infected, you probably wouldn't even notice it because your immune system is already you know, protected with all the, I mean, you have antibodies, so you're unlikely to even sustain an infection. And you, even if you had it, even if you didn't notice any side effects, could you transmit it? Not likely. Okay. Yeah, not likely, just because uh, you probably would not even generate a sufficient amount of infection. That's why. Yeah, thank you. Question from John, might the decline of the death rate we see be more of a case of declining capacity of the virus over masking, social distancing, et cetera? Oh, so, you know, they, this is a really good point. Um, the data that we look at that they, they show on CNN almost every night of the, the charts, that's actually the data that re reflects, you know, the uh, reduction in the amount of infection. Yes, that actually shows a reduction in new cases that is related to social distancing, mask wearing, and vaccination. I agree. Um, as far as what I showed, what I showed uh, is not, um, it's more, what I showed was more theoretical about the virulence versus attenuation. Okay. And when is the maximal antibody response reached post-vaccination? Ah, great question. So as you guys may be aware, the, um, uh, the you know, the vaccine, the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have two doses. And so uh, you will have, you know, about 80% immunity after the first, you know, after the first uh, injection is done. And I think that's at 28 days, around 28 days. So you have about 80% immunity. You have, a, you know, 100% immunity after the second dose is completed, two weeks after the, uh, uh, after that second dose. And the reason why is what you've built up is memory cells memory B cells and memory T cells in the, mem in the immune system. So, th so now anytime your body sees that virus again, it, it reacts. So it's the same thing as having the chicken pox uh, vaccination or the, the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine that we've had, you know. It says the article in the New Yorker suggested some may have natural immunity to COVID. Is this a possibility? Yeah, it's possible. And the reason, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a great question, really. And um, some people have the luck of the draw when it comes to genetics and their immune system, right? And so there's a particular pro, uh, factor, it's called MHC. And that really determines whether you have a good or medium or not so good response to a pathogen, okay. So yeah, that's exactly right. Some people can be immune. And can long haulers with COVID-19 continue to infect others? Probably, they probably have persistent levels of virus. These are the ones that I would be most concerned about because they probably feel, well, I guess maybe the long haulers don't feel well, but the asymptomatics feel okay. So they may be walking around and spreading virus. That's a concern. So the fact that we have people that are affected with high pathogenicity, people that are asymptomatic, and then some that are long haulers, that's a wide range of effects. And that's all related to Im immune, like the immunogenetics. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate the need for a booster for the, the variants in a year or yearly? That is a really good question. And so what I've seen right now is 
that the tests that have been done have shown that even the South African variant and the UK variants are, um, are handled by the immunity that you get from the Pfizer and the Moderna. So I think for those, it's, it's not a problem. Will there be other variants that are able to escape from the immunity? It's possible. We may see that this will be a situation kind of like the influenza vaccine, like after, you know, after two years, you may, maybe there'll be another, but, um, you know, like, like Fauci said before, the whole picture here is the better job we do at stamping out the transmission, uh, the better off we are, you know, that's, that's really the issue here is how well you stamp it out. Linda asks, did the recent WHO visit to China do anything to clarify origins? I think that the issue is that they are not able to uh, get their get a good look at the, you know, the materials and the and the locations and the samples and all that kind of stuff. I think that's the problem. It's a great question, though. Unfortunately, I think we're in a situation where it, you know, it's going to be hard for us to get really direct answers on that, though. Next, due to the long incubation without pathology, would it still attenuate virulence? <laughs> For the long haulers, well, uh, the answer, that's a, that, again, these are really great questions, absolutely. Yeah. So, so the attenuation happens no matter what, it's going to attenuate, um, uh, they, it, it will mutate, and in fact, you know, it turns out that this uh, attenuation may actually be the thing that um, helps us because, you know, you can think about it like this. There are viruses that we use for immunity as vaccines and they are attenuated. The smallpox vaccine was an attenuated virus. And by attenuated, we mean weakened, right? So the fact that there are attenuated uh, SARS-CoV-2 floating around in the population kind of helps us a little bit, you know. Uh, but um, um, I, I think vaccination is probably the most important aspect right now. Thank you. A question uh, for our winter lecture series committee. Uh, at what time are we going to close the chat questions? We've had a lot of great ones. <laughs> Would Dick or Sherrod or Chuck like to chime in? 8.30. 8.30, okay, excellent, excellent. We still have time. Okay, Lucy asks, why do people with a higher percentage of Neanderthal genes have more severe reactions to COVID? Oh, is that true? I, I was not aware of that. Um, it, and if that's true, that may tell us something about the background uh, immunogenetics of uh, those people with those genes. I didn't know if that was the case or not. But it, you know, if, you, if that were the case, I would look specifically at immunomarkers relating to, you know, like I said, MHC, because MH, major histocompatibility, those are the genes that control your immune response to viruses. Terry says, my understanding is that they do not know whether a vaccinated person can contract or collect COVID in their nose cavities and then transmit it to others. Should we still wear a mask until this is further researched? I think, you know, that's a great question. And, and um, it, you know, the not knowing part is, is, it's accurate. I mean, we just don't know for sure a lot of things about this. Um, I think the right answer is that we all need to continue wearing masks, be careful, you know, let, I always, my, you know, in my lab, the rule is don't become part of the experiment, you know, yourself. <laughs> so we don't, we don't want to be part of the experiment. You know? So uh, yeah, I, I, you just, we just need to continue to be careful. Thank you. Okay, David asks, which post COVID patients should be vaccinated? Ah, so, you know, so post COVID when, you know, that means that you have strong immunity already. And so the rule of thumb that the CDC is, is putting out is at least three months after you have recovered from your infection, you know, you should have strong immunity for at least three months. 
and then you know then you can um, look into getting vaccinated i think There's a remark here about the great impact that smallpox, smallpox had on Native Americans. And yes. if you contrast that with the concept of attenuation. So this is a, you know, and, and uh, like I said, I teach this course on viral evolution. And this is one of the examples that we've talked about. And, um, uh, you know, the decimation of Native Americans was up to about 90% because of smallpox, right? Uh, you know, it, did the virus become attenuated? Yes, it did. You know, it took years, you know, uh, for it to become attenuated in that population. But once again, the, the answer here was, here was a population who was naive to the virus. So it was highly pathogenic in them. It's the same situation with these bat viruses and humans. Uh, we, we are naive to those viruses. That's why they're bad for us. David has two questions. First, what about the medical use of ACE inhibitors and in risk to SARS-CoV-2 infection? Wow, that is a great question because uh, in fact, that was something that I looked at early and it turns out that angiotensin converting enzyme two is a, 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 a protein that's involved with you know, the like blood pressure response. And um, you know these blood pressure drugs um, actually bind to that receptor. And so there's been a lot of question about whether they either enhance uh, COVID infection or do they reduce it? And right now we don't know the answer to that because no clear experiments have been done. But um, what happens when somebody is on that drug is the level of ACE2 protein goes up about threefold. It's more abundant. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for uh, COVID or for the SARS-CoV-2? We don't know the answer to that, but I know that there are clinical trials going on now about that. Thank you. David's second question, is the GI tract involved in transmission of SARS-CoV-2 or is it almost always through the mucous membranes of the respiratory tract? So it's mostly respiratory tract, but you, you can get disseminated virus, and we know that. I mean, that people end up with, uh, with uh, you know, viremia in different organs, and, and we even know that it has neurological effects. So it's possible that it, it can uh, replicate an epithelia in, in the GI tract as well. But, um, you know, the main target is the lungs. And then there's a follow-up question about smallpox and the effect on Native Americans. Uh, yeah. Who changed Native Americans or the smallpox virus? The answer is both. Okay, so it's a great question. Okay, and what that relates to is changes in mutations in virus and mutations in host. It turns out that in fact both happen at the same time. You know, that's what we see in uh, the way viruses interact with the, their hosts is they cause changes in you know, genes, uh, basically gene population in, in the population, so. Okay. Thank you. I think we are finished with the chat questions. So I am going to uh, permit everyone to unmute, but remember we have a lot of people in this chat. And so if you would like, you can um, unmute yourself and ask a question. Before um, Dr. Angeletti began, there was a question um, if he would comment about the guitars in the background. <laughs> Should I pull one down? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, um, I, it's sort of a hobby, sort of a, something to de-stress, you know? So yeah, I have a couple of nice old guitars. The one that I like the most is the one that's the arch top back here. That one is uh, from the mid 1950s. Uh, that's the same guitar that uh, Elvis Presley used to play back in the 50s. Uh, it doesn't sound great anymore because it's uh, kind of warped, but uh, I like it as just kind of a wall piece. But yeah, I, I just enjoy guitars. Aaron done it. <clears throat> great question. <laughs> well, after an answer with Elvis Presley, and it's hard to ask another question. But you, you mentioned that an ideal time for the mutation to occur is under selection pressure as the virus is transmitted from person to person. 
Yeah. What else causes, is, is there any identifiable thing other than dumb luck and so forth that causes this virus to mutate? Yeah, so, uh, so you have different, you know, you have different conditions. You could have pre-existing mutations or you can have a situation where mutations are occurring in the new host, uh, in the virus. Um, it, it's going to be, you know, uh, the mutations are always occurring, let's put it that way. It's just a question about whether you, they actually persist or not. Think about it like this, that if a mutation is bad for virus replication, that virus will die, it will not replicate, it will be lost from the population. So that's what happens. If it's a mutation that's good, let's say it's a mutation that improves binding to ACE2, then it will be more prevalent. It's basically all selection. Are there multiple generations of uh, virus within one infection in a human? So that's a good one. And the answer, and here's the thing that I'm gonna tell you is, uh, there's a, there's a um, concept that we call in, in viral evolution called quasi-species. That means a person can have multiple variant or multiple mutation, mutations in a virus in a single person. And it's possible that that's happening in, in a person, that they can have more than one mutant. Uh, but once again, I mean, uh, for the most part, it's not going to be an issue as long as the person has a good, strong immune response. You know. Hello, um, I'm wondering, since the bat seems to be the primary starter of all this, has anyone talked about how bats could be getting it in the first place? Or yeah, it's starting a, with them? It's a, it's a great question, yeah. And so the answer is more than likely that this is just what we call an endemic virus to the bats. They carry it. It's just, you know, they probably had it for millennia. Do they share it with other animals? That's possible. But the other thing you could think about is, you know, as an ecological niche, having a virus like that kind of helps you. Like, let's say that the bats come in contact with other mammals um, and the mammal, the other mammal gets the, gets the virus and can't survive it. So maybe they're all both feeding on the same fruit. And in a way that's an ecological advantage for the bat that carries the, the virus. So you can think about it like that. I mean, you know, these viruses have more than one role in, in their host species. But I would say right now, I'm going to say that the bats carry, have carried those viruses for a long time, probably thousands of years. The question Seems as if we could go on for a long time. Let's uh, have this final question from David and then call it a night. After the answer, of course. I was curious to know about the, the post-COVID uh, complications, um, if that's related to the immune system of the individual or something specific with the virus particle. I'm talking about the neurologic, the cardiovascular, uh, renal systemic issues. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And so I was doing a project with the uh, Global Health uh, Center at uh, UNMC and I interviewed a guy who, who spent 37 days in the hospital uh, with COVID. And so he, he told me what it was like. And so he had a lot of those secondary effects and you know things like uh, AFib, uh, heart palpitations and renal uh, failure kind of problems. So I think it's a combination of the two. The stronger immune immune system, better immune response is better at eliminating the virus before it gets into, into different organs and causes more damage. So the unfortunate thing with COVID is that we found that it can cause damage in lots of different tissues. And that effect that we see of like, uh, that people can't smell or taste, that is because the virus is getting into the nerves right? And we now know that the virus actually gets into the CNS, you know? So, I mean, there are a lot of things to worry about if, if you, you know, uh, if you have it for long term. So, uh, yeah, it's better, you know, to, to clear it out early, I guess. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time.
if everyone wants to react or you can turn your your um, mic on and say thank you. What an excellent session. Thank you so much, Peter. Lots thank of you. thumbs up and claps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Remind people that there's one more lecture thank next you. week. Thank you. It will be Professor Sharon Schoolman from UNMC talking about sorting through racial disparities in COVID-19. Excellent. See you next Bye. week, everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Bye. Thank you.